today's scripture is from John 9, 1 through 16. And as you're looking that up in your pew Bible, if you wish, in this scripture, Jesus corrects a commonly held notion that suffering comes because of sin. The healed blind man became a confident spokesman for Jesus, but his testimony failed to convince the Pharisees who rejected Jesus' teaching about why the man had been born blind. Let's read the scripture. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Teacher, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it a result of his own sins or those of his parents? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. He was born blind so the power of God could be seen in him. And all of us must quickly carry out the tasks assigned by us by the one who sent me. Because there is little time left before the night falls and all the work comes to an end. But while I am still here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smoothed the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed, and he came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, is this the same man, that beggar? Some said he was, and others said, no, but he surely looks like him. And the beggar kept saying, I am the same man. They asked, well, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and smoothed it on my eyes and told me to go to the pool of Siloam and wash off the mud. And I went, and I washed, and now I can see. Where is he now? Well, I don't know, the man replied. Then they took the man to the Pharisees. Now as it happened, Jesus had healed the man on a Sabbath. The Pharisees asked the man all about it again. So he told them, he smoothed the mud on my eyes, and when it was washed away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Deacon. Back where we come from in Georgia, at Trinity, we knew of a few celebrities in the congregation by the name of Cheryl and Barbara Jennings. When we arrived at the church over 13 years ago in 2003, Cheryl had passed away. But over that time, I got to know Barbara, <coughs> to hear her and Cheryl's story, to hear about their life and the miracles that God brought in their life and the way that they became, just by a matter of miracle, celebrities. Cheryl was born blind. And after struggling with blindness for 40 years, Doctors heard of his story and his personal uh, condition with his eyes, and they were making breakthrough progress with bringing healing to those particular ailments. Barbara and Cheryl met with doctors across Atlanta, even as far as New England, and after undergoing some studies and some research, became the uh, guinea pig for those experiments. And after 40 years of being blind through much therapy and many surgeries, Cheryl began, began to regain his sight, or to see. It was since his birth, the first time, for instance, that he was able to see color, and shape, and form. And though that time of getting his sight slowly but surely through multiple surgeries, he had to learn how to see. Barbara wrote in her journal at that time that like a baby, Cheryl had to learn how to see everything. It was new, exciting scary, 
unsure of what seeing means, still no perspective. For instance, when Cheryl came upon a horse for the first time and scared the living daylights out of him, not only did he have to learn colors and shape, but to make sense of what he was seeing. He had to learn how to negotiate in the world, how to remember to look down and watch his step, little things and big things, almost creating a sense of joy in the family, but also a sense of fear. Cheryl suffered from many panic attacks, had to go through various types of therapies. One of the most helpful to him was art therapy, and he became an amazing artist where he would draw the shapes and the colors that he experienced in the world, producing a wide-ranging body of art that uh, not only made him uh, earn a living through that, but also gain some popularity in the nation. Hollywood caught notice, and after some wrangling and some conversations, a movie was made based on their story, starring Val Kilmer and Mara Savino. Some pretty heavy, uh, pretty heavy hitting uh, celebrities there who brought their story to the screen in a movie called At First Sight. So if you go home and read At First Sight, it says based on a true story, I knew those people. Right? But it was intriguing how learning how to see required this great deal of emotional impact, this great deal of learning the different ways to see the world and to make sense of it. Today's scripture lesson deals with sight, but more so with learning how to see. And it also deals with perspective and a healthy dose of what we call in the literary world, irony, which is where characters either say something or do something or walk into, a, into the middle of a situation and fail to see the deeper truths and deeper meaning of what they are saying or what they are doing. That's irony for you. Now, over these past three weeks, you and me walked through the wilderness experience as we make our way to the cross and to the tomb of Easter. And we're not in the wilderness today, but we are still walking, perhaps stumbling in the dark a time or two. And we find ourselves walking with Jesus as Jesus comes upon a blind man, blind from birth, and begs, and confronts the blindness of sorts of Pharisees and disciples and a crowd of awfully confused people. Let's recap the story very briefly. Uh, you noted it, Maury read it, gave a nice introduction to that. Jesus is walking along, comes upon a blind man, and the disciples automatically jump into a debate. They want to figure out why the man is born blind. And the question was one that every Jew may have asked at that time, is it because he sinned or his parents sinned? Always looking for a way to blame something or something. And of course, in that world, if there was an ailment, you would probably blame it on sin. Now we note that this debate stretches all the way back into the Old Testament, where even the rabbis and the authors and many writers of the Old Testament debated this. Read stories like First and Second Kings, for instance, and they'll say that a person was sick or ill because of sin in their life. But go on the other side of the debate and read books like Job or Ecclesiastes, <coughs> and you'll note that Job throws something in the debate that states that wicked, that evil hits both the wicked and the righteous. Ecclesiastes states that the same rain that falls on those who are God's people is the same, is the same rain that falls on those who are not God's people. And so here we have the disciples carrying on a lively debate, talking about this blind man, failing, as Jesus did, to see the opportunity that this blind man presents. Jesus states very clearly, I am the light of the world, and this man is here in order so that God might work a mighty work in him. Jesus didn't see a debate. He saw an opportunity. Well, Jesus does something peculiar. He bends down, he spits in some mud, and makes a salve, almost recalling that story back in Genesis where we confront light again. You remember the first few chapters of Genesis? God says, let there be light. And after that, creation comes into being, God calls it good, and he gathers the mud man, Adam, Adam literally means in Hebrew, earth or mud, gathers mud together and breathes into that mud man his spirit, and there we have the creation of life. So here Jesus puts some spit together in mud and recalls that creation story, puts it on his eyes and says, go, and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. A nice allusion perhaps to baptism. The man 
man goes, and Jesus finishes what God starts in creation by bringing this man to a place of wholeness where he can see again. The neighbors see him, and certainly they would have seen him begging day after day and say, is this the one? Is this the man? Certainly he can't be. It is me. It's me. Well, who did this to you? I don't know, some guy, his name is Jesus. Well, we're going to bring you to the Pharisees. So they bring him to the Pharisees. And what do the Pharisees do instead of praise God? They argue about something else. It's the Sabbath. Who dares to heal a man on the Sabbath? And, and by the way, if somebody's healing a man, how can anyone heal anyone? How can anyone <coughs> who's a sinner heal? And so you follow the story past 16, read all the way to verse 41, and you see that there's this balance between light and sight, blindness, a different way of looking at blindness, and this idea of sin, where everyone is calling each other a sinner and trying to figure out who sinned more and who sinned and who sinned there until you get to the end where Jesus says, all of you who think you can see, you're the real sinner. In verse 41. <coughs> and in the middle of that stands a man who was blind, but can now see. And he says, I don't know what you're all debating about. All I know is what happened to me, for I was blind, but now I see the entire narrative in John revolves around sight. And not just the sight to the blind man. He doesn't really have any issues. He's happy as a lark. Eventually he praises God and Jesus right there. No issues with him. But the story also deals with the sight of everyone else. That's irony after all. Unbeknownst to the disciples and the neighbors and the Pharisees, it's really their eyes that need some healing. And it's really them that walk and stumble in the dark. So what's going on in the truth of this situation? Jesus is the Messiah who heals the world, who is repairing the ruptures in creation. But all everyone wants to do is debate the rightness or the wrongness of it, who sinned, or debate whether or not things that happen in this world make sense. According to one commentator, all the characters surrounding Jesus, not necessarily including the blind man, want to debate because this is how their eyes have been formed, how the world has taught them to see. They see by the lesser lights of the institutions into which they were born. All the blind man knows is that this Jesus moved him from the bottomless abyss of darkness and brought him to great light. That Jesus completed that goal of creation in him in order to work a mighty work of God in his life. But everyone else continues to stumble in the darkness. The disciples ask, who sinned? Who sinned? We're always looking for somebody to blame, right? Something happens to us, we want to ask why. We say, is it this person? Is it that person? Is it something that happened in my life? Why is this happening to me? And through all of those questionings of why, we are blinded because we debate the theology of trying to figure things out. So here we have the disciples blinded by debating theology, something that often gets Jesus' disciples all worked up. And it's not just any theology, it's bad theology. For in seeing this blind man, they fail to see this man for who he is, but rather argue about whether or not it was sin that created this blindness. Could they have done something differently? Rather than using this man as a place for debate, labeling him outright as a sinner, could they have perhaps invited him to follow along with Jesus? This is John chapter 9. After all, they've been walking with Jesus for a while. They've seen the miracles that Jesus has brought in their life. Could they not have invited Jesus to work a miracle on this blind man? They could have done things differently. Maybe Jesus couldn't have healed you of blindness, but come along anyway. We want you to follow Jesus, but instead of seeing an opportunity to invite another disciple to experience Jesus in their life, they make themselves busy by debating theology. So they go to the neighbors. The neighbors don't recognize him. Who is this guy? Now you think that the neighbors would know who he, what he looks like, right? I mean, he's been begging for all these years. He's been the town blindsman for all those years. You, you would think that once they recognize him, they would know that this is indeed the man who was blind, but they don't. Noting all too often that when we see people on the street who make us uncomfortable, 
maybe ask us for money or we see people who are destitute, we often avert our eyes. You know, in New York, it's don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. In New York, you gotta walk briskly. You make eye contact, you may have to give the guy money. But it exposes the blindness of these neighbors. For you realize that they didn't pay any attention to him. They never really took a good look at him. In confronting his habit of begging and in confronting his blindness, we sense that the neighbors never really see the man for who he is. They see his ailment. They may get annoyed at the fact that he begs. But they never look in his direction long enough to know that when he comes on the scene healed, they can't even recognize him. And furthermore, it doesn't make sense. If the disciples were blinded by the debate of theology, then we can probably rightly say that the neighbors are blinded by science. You remember that song? She blinded me with science. She knew it. <laughs> Or was it? Oh, yes. <laughs> and often, uh, when we see something that doesn't make sense, we want to nail everything down. Hey, if it doesn't make sense, if it's not scientific, if it doesn't make sense in my world, we kind of cast it aside. And we see here that these neighbors are blinded by science, perhaps blinded by the fact that they want to put God in a box. Hey, if God doesn't make sense to me, then certainly this isn't the work of God. So we have a debate going on in one corner where people want to put labels on somebody else, and then we have a blindness in the other corner where they want to put God in the box. If God doesn't show up the way I want him to show up, then certainly this isn't God. And then, of course, they bring to the Pharisees, and it gets even worse. Rather than praising God for this miracle, rather than hugging this man who had been born blind, who had struggled all of his life, who had to make a living from begging, they debate the Sabbath. What nerve do the Pharisees have to get into their little legalistic pockets in a corner of the universe by debating whether or not this man should have been healed? And by the way, if he was healed, then what sinner could have healed him? And they're blinded by none other than their religiosity. If the neighbors who wanted to prove this medical miracle by science put God in the box, then certainly it was the Pharisees who wanted to put man in the box to attract this man and the legalistic jots and tittles and iotas and crossing the T's of every word of scripture because something isn't right. It comes down to not whether or not God had worked a miracle, but whether or not it was right to heal a man on the Sabbath. They're blinded by their own debate. All three camps, the disciples and the neighbors and the Pharisees are blinded by the fact that like Cheryl Jennings, when they confront Jesus, they have to realize their own blind spots. That they have grown thick spiritual cataracts in their upbringing that blinds them from the opportunities of God, living into the mysteries of God, and experiencing the idea in Jesus Christ that God is doing something new, beyond their expectations and assumptions, beyond the debates and the opinions. In walking into the mystery of God in order to bring people who are blind and destitute into the very family of God to work a miracle in their lives. You see, the neighbors and the disciples and the Pharisees play it safe. It's easy to debate opinions and theology. It's easy to try to have a conversation about science in order to wield God's power under the rubric of something we understand. It's very easy to talk about people. But inviting people in seeing beyond the labels, experiencing a relationship beyond what we're comfortable with, well, that's a totally different ballgame. You see, while these three camps wanted to debate theology, Jesus lived it. While they wanted to talk about the blind man, they failed to recognize their own blindness. And by talking about this man in the third person all the time, they failed to realize that God's light is cast wide enough to include people that they might not have even expected. Paul says it best, you are to rise from death, to rise from your sleep, for your light has come, therefore live as children of the light. Rise from the dead, your deep darkness, Paul encourages you. 
that Christ's light might shine upon, shine upon you. Well, like babies, we have to experience that we too may have spiritual blind spots. That there are many areas in our life in which we continue to walk in darkness. It may be our pension to debate. It may be the fact that we question God or say that perhaps God doesn't work like I do because it just doesn't make sense. It's not scientific enough. Or perhaps we have put God in a box and therefore put our neighbors in a box because of our legalism and our religiosity. And so we experience in the story where we find ourselves in the story that perhaps Jesus' is light is casting dispersions on our own darkness and revealing in us and exposing in us the blindness that often gets in the way between us and God and us and our neighbors. Jesus doesn't see a beggar. He doesn't see a blind man. He doesn't see an opportunity for a great debate. Rather, he sees a person who has a need person who has been left behind and left out, and an opportunity to work the miracles of God in this person's life. And if God can see that person, then certainly God can see us, and sees in us the opportunities that God wants to work in our life as well, to bring us out of our own darkness and into the great light that shines that no darkness can overcome. Jesus is on our side, and people are starting to recognize that Christ is the light of the world, even though we may have some spiritual cataracts that Jesus needs to deal with in our life. In the Atlantic <clears throat> this past week, not a very Christian magazine, not a Christian magazine at all, as quite secular and humanist as you can get, research came out that showed that it is none other than Christians, people who attend, attend church more specifically, who have a higher capacity of compassion and empathy and, in their words, tolerance for people who are different than they. Imagine that. You're used to people saying that Christians are the most judgmental in the room, that Christians are hateful, that Christians don't like this and that, or cast dispersions and judge others. But what they found is that there are two types of Christians. First of all, they study non-Christians. Showed that non-Christians, people who didn't experience Christ in their life, were the most divisive and the most intolerant, either from the left and from the right. Then they studied Christians who didn't attend church, and they too revealed that there was a lack of empathy and compassion. And then they found this large group, I like to call it a silent minority, but a growing minority, of regular churchgoers, in which they realized that Christians who actually attended church more often and had accountability groups and learned what it was like, what learned what it means to be Christ's church, had more compassion, greater empathy, and the greater ability to communicate with people who are different from them, and to welcome them. See, that's what it means to be Christ's church. When the world starts to take notice of something that Christ's church is doing well, then you know Christ is in the midst of this body of believers and the body of believers across the nation. Why is that? Because we have experienced Christ. We too have seen the power of God in our midst and can come to the, to the place where we say, listen, I can't explain these miracles all the time. I don't know all of the answers. Sure, we talk about theology, but I don't have all the right answers no more than you do. But I'll tell you what, I was blind, but now I see. I was enslaved, but now I am free. Christ's church, statistically, has a greater and more varied amount of compassion and empathy because we have an experience of what it means to see. And we have learned to see. And we see people, not labels, or people who are branded, or people that just gives us opportunities to debate, but rather we see people in their deepest needs and follow a Lord who is indeed the light of the world. The fact of the matter is that when we walk in Christ's light, Christ continues to reveal in us our spiritual blind spots so that we too can see the needs around us and join Christ at work in a world that greatly needs the kind of healing and reparation 
reconciliation that Jesus brings. We have a story to tell the nations. And we have a Savior to show to the nations, who the path of sorrow hath trod, that all of the world's great peoples may come to the truth of God, may come to the truth of God. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. Where do you find yourself in this story? And I pray that you, like the blind man, are praising God, for though you were blind, through Christ you can now see. Amen. Let us pray together.